Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here, and welcome to the wondrously wild wasteland of Fallout 4. A window into a terrifying alternate reality, where mankind has finally pushed the boundaries of technology and conflict just to tad over their respective edges. While looking around at the destroyed buildings and desertified landscape certainly makes for a captivating experience, I think what really sells the Fallout universe as one I'd like to stay away from are the terrifying mutants that inhabit it. Absurd amounts of radiation and over 200 years for life to marinate in it has transformed many otherwise beautiful animals, insects, and even some people into some really spooky beings. So, I figured what better video to make today than one that explores some of the more interesting or otherwise rare monsters and mutants that inhabit the lands of Fallout 4. Sit back, turn up that radiator, and relax, as we jump right into our fourth episode of five rare and or interesting creature types you may have missed in Fallout 4. Before we begin, quick note. In the past, I've directed this series exclusively at looking at rare creature types. You know, mythic death claws, albino gator claws, that sort of thing. In this one, I'm going to be taking some advice I've been getting from the comment section, and also featuring one or two individual creatures. We'll see how that goes, tell me how you feel about it in the comment section down below. But anyway, with that out of the way, and without any further ado, let's do further. Starting off, we have the Exploding Mole Rats. These hilarious, formerly furry friends are a variant of the normal mole rat that we all know and love, and can be encountered exclusively in two locations. The Kendall Parking Garage, and just outside of Satellite Array Olivia. They can also sporadically be seen in some random encounter ambushes, but more on those later. As their name suggests, exploding mole rats aren't built to last particularly long. Rather than merely nibble at your ankles like their generic counterparts tend to do, exploding mole rats will rush the player and attempt to detonate the two fragmentation mine charges they have strapped to their bodies, which will deal 40 points of damage depending on how close you are to the detonation and also kill the mole rat in the process. You'll note a very similar tactic is commonly employed by super mutant suiciders. Though, they tend to use a mini-nuke rather than fragmentation mines, making them a good bit more dangerous. However, aside from these charges, explosive mole rats are identical to normal ones, both statistically and in their appearance. Now, something I find really neat about these creatures is that there's in fact a good bit of lore behind them, if only a little. If we head on over to the Kendall parking garage, we'll find a very strange scene. As mentioned, there is a population of exploding mole rats here for you to watch out for. But among them will be a lone human woman named Drifter. While the mole rats here will of course be very hostile as soon as they spot the player, this woman won't be, at least not at first. As soon as she sees the mole rats attacking you, she'll join them. But, if she doesn't see the mole rats attack, she won't. Some further inspection of the game's files reveals that this drifter and the mole rats are in the same faction. Now, with all of that said, if we sneak up to this woman and interact with her, before attracting the attention of any of the mole rats, we'll hear her utter some unique dialogue, as she rambles on about her pet, Ratties and some other weird nonsense. Take a listen. Hey there. Yeah. Do we eat this one, Ratties? No. Not yet. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Yellow powder, white powder, burnt tree. Yeah. I think we can safely say something is very wrong with this chick. Towards the back of the structure will be a workshop-like area, with cages, fragmentation mines, and duct tape scattered everywhere. It's not hard to connect the dots and realize that this crazy woman has been the one making the explosive mole rats in the first place. As for the other location we can face off against these beasts at, well, that's just outside of USAF Satellite Array Olivia. 
a now radar occupied former US military satellite and surveillance station. Here, just outside of the eastern fence, a small pack of mole rats can be encountered, and at least one of them should be rigged with explosives. This guy's origins, however, are far less clear. At first, it seems reasonably safe to assume that the nearby raiders have something to do with it. Maybe they're training and rigging mole rats with explosives, then placing them around their perimeter to better secure their position, or something. But that seems to be unlikely for a couple of reasons. One, the mole rats and raiders will often engage each other in combat if either gets too close, and neither of them are in the same faction. So it's very improbable that they have something to do with each other. My favorite theory that many over on Reddit have proposed is that perhaps the entire population of explosive mole rats in the game all hail from Kendall Parking Garage, and that single mad drifter. Perhaps a few of them just escaped or got let go, and one made their way over here to Satellite Array Olivia, and a few others also became potential random encounters. Or maybe there are indeed multiple lunatics out there rigging these poor little critters with detonator charges. Whatever their story, these mole rats are quite cool. Some might say that they're the bomb. Next on our list, we'll be taking a look at an individual creature rather than an entire class. Let's set sail to Far Harbor and allow me to introduce you to Grun. He's a super mutant behemoth trapped behind a set of titanium warehouse doors at a local Vim pot plant, guarded by a small force of mutants who occupy the factory. And how he got here is an incredibly intriguing tale. You see, Grun was once the very leader of this entire clan of super mutants. They're not native to Far Harbor. Instead, this tribe hails from somewhere in the mainland United States. Which is a pretty significant piece of information. You see, all of the super mutants we meet back in the Commonwealth had their origins in institute experiments with the FEV virus gone array. However, super mutants outside of the Boston area, such as those in New California or Washington DC, were born out of other means. The West Coast mutant population comes from experiments undergone at the Mariposa military base before the war, and those in the Capital Wasteland are largely the product of failed FEV research at Vault 81. Furthermore, it's also possible that events elsewhere led to more mutants in different regions. The point is that since we don't know exactly where he's from, Grun and all of the mutants who came to Far Harbor for that matter may be of considerably different genetic makeup than the ones we meet anywhere else in the game. But I digress. Shortly after arriving on the island however many years ago, Grun's tribe set up shop here, at this old Vim factory. Before the bombs fell, Vim was once a local soda company popular in the state of Maine. While Nuka-Cola dominated everywhere else, Vim managed to outperform it wildly in its home state, much to Nuka-Cola's dismay. And this was their principal factory and headquarters. Well, as soon as they settled in, the mutants began consuming leftover Vim, which the factory was just loaded with. They drank it like it was water, and then slowly started to experience some weird side effects, if you will. Most of the men became considerably more hostile and aggressive, Grun especially. Though one of the members, a mutant named Erickson, had the opposite effect. He became more intelligent and passive, causing him to start believing his tribe's practice of attacking and often eating innocent people was, you know, kinda bad. So Erickson hatched a cunning plan. He lured Grun, the strongest of the tribe, into a large warehouse within the factory, and sealed the doors behind him, locking him in there, presumably forever, before he himself ran away. We can later meet Erickson in the game at an abandoned Skylane's crash site, where he's built a home for himself and is non-hostile to visitors. It's through our dialogue with Erickson and some left behind terminals that we know any of this story in the first place. Well, back at the factory, what the mutants did afterwards is quite hilarious. Rather than let their boss go, which could have been done relatively easy through the use of a couple of terminals, they instead chose to leave him in there. 
The reason, as Erickson suggests, is that Grun was probably so angry after being trapped, all of the mutants at the factory feared he would attack them in a fit of rage if let out of his confines. So, they decided not to let him go. And funnily enough, when we arrive at the plant, if we access the terminals and free Grun ourselves, he will indeed start attacking his former men, and really making quick work of them too, helping us out quite a bit. Unfortunately though, he'll be far from friendly with the player. And thus, this will have to be where his story ends, as he'll turn on us too, leading to one final boss battle in the factory. At least, that is, if you let him go. Alternatively, you can just leave him trapped in there and clear out all the other mutants just fine. But if you do decide to let him go, just understand what's ahead of you. A little bit of a fun fact before we move on is that Grun, when translated from German, means green, the same color of his skin. Though not the color of his feelings, which are probably very red right now. Coming in at number 3, back to the mainland we go to take a look at the ghouls of Suffolk County Charter School. Suffolk County Charter School is home to a unique variant of feral ghoul, which boasts a much pinker complexion than your average zombified fellow. Notably, they don't respawn either. There's somewhere between 12 and 24 at the school, and once they've been killed, they're gone. That's it. Some ghouls will continue to spawn at this location, but they won't be pink. These pink ones, statistically, are in fact a good bit weaker than average too for some reason, spawning in with only 10 points of base HP compared to a standard Feral Ghoul's 35, and only 15 points of energy resistance versus 20. So you've actually got less to fear when confronting these guys. The story behind their pink complexion is perhaps one of my favorite narratives revealed by the entire game. Before the bombs fell, Suffolk County Charter School's principal, a Miss Jackie Hudson, agreed to accept a considerable amount of funds from the US government, in exchange for her school's participation in a very sinister experiment. The government demanded that all food at the school be substituted, with a disgusting and strange pink paste. This was the only thing to be consumed by both staff and students when on campus. Anyone found to be bringing their own meals was to have the items confiscated and be strongly disciplined. Government scientists were periodically to head to the school and monitor their findings. Evidently, as we learned from terminals at the building, as well as some at vault regional headquarters, this paste was developed in a collaboration between the US government and vault -Tec. Their objective was to create a food substitute that was much cheaper to manufacture and with an infinite shelf life. It would be at Suffolk County Charter School, where they monitored the paste's effects on children. Sadly, it seems those effects were on the unfortunate side. Aside from tasting just awful, shortly after the program was introduced, the school students began experiencing an internal wave of aggression and behavior problems. Though the principal mostly blamed these on morale issues rather than any chemical imbalance in the paste itself. Though only months after the program's introduction at this school, the bombs fell. So scientists didn't really have enough time to fully understand its effects, and it never saw implementation at volts. Though 200 years later, those who consumed the paste and later ghoulified now have it to thank for their horrifying pink complexion, implying that the paste really did have some serious negative consequences outside of behavior. Lucky everyone, vault Tech never got around to finishing this experiment. Otherwise, that would be just one more reason to stay a hell away from any of their bunkers. For fourth spot, it's back to Far Harbor once again, to look at a creature that's a bit different than anything else we've covered so far. Rather than being a variant of a prominent species like the exploding mole rats or glowing mire lurks, the subject of this part of the video is its own independent animal, the rad chicken. Found exclusively on the island, rad chickens are some incredibly elusive birds. They only have a few select potential spawn locations and are both insanely skittish and insanely quick. If the sole survivor is so much as detected by one of these oh-so-tasty mutants, 
expect them to be gone before you even notice them. Their small size doesn't do us any favors when looking either. It's because of these elusive characteristics that I personally never even knew rad chickens were a thing until I started covering Fallout 4 extensively on this channel. Never did I notice one in normal gameplay before without knowing exactly what I was looking for. Boasting a body roughly identical to that of a normal chicken's from today's world, their lack of feathers and a few blisters seem to be the only consequences of their prolonged exposure to radiation and the fog. Making it fair to say that chickens sort of got off easy with this whole apocalypse thing. Meanwhile, you have cows getting second heads and fish growing limbs. I guess it's fair to say that these rad chickens are far less egg-siding than most of Fallout 4's mutants. And finally, last on our list, we head on over to Nuka World to encounter the Bromoluff Longhorn. These are the rarest species of Bromoluff we can find at the theme park. Bromoluffs are the descendants of African water buffalo who were penned in at Nuka World Safari Adventure, who later escaped following the Great War and mutated into these two-headed creatures. There's four different variants of Bromoluff that inhabit the theme park. There's the Pack Bromoluff, a variant domesticated by humans and used to transport goods, the normal Bromoluff, that's the most common, the Bromoluff Shorthorn, which has an albino appearance and shorter horns, and finally, these Bromoluff Longhorns, which boast much darker fur and, notably, longer horns. Statistically, all of the variants are identical, though Bromoluff Longhorns do seem to boast an extra 10 points of ballistic damage resistance for some reason or another. Again, everywhere else in their stats menu, they're the same. They have 415 points of HP, 8 perception, spawn in at level 40, like all the others. It's just that ballistics damage statistic that distinguishes them. There's not tremendously more to say about these guys. They are the rarest form of Bromoluff we can meet, and frankly I'm including these mostly because I wanted to record a bunch of Bromoluffs. When I was a child, my favorite animal was the buffalo, and when asked in preschool what I wanted to be when I grew up, my answer was a buffalo. So I feel like this is me just servicing my past self. It's my channel, leave me alone. Anyway, with that we are going to wrap up. Five rare and interesting creature types in Fallout 4. Thanks for stopping by everybody. Which of these mutated monstrous monstrosities did you find to be the most monsterfying? And which beast should this series tackle next, if we get around to it? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Seriously, I, I mean it. It really actually helps. There's a lot of analytic stuff I can show you, but please, you get the idea. Like ratings help. Anyway, again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.